Well, we're talking about John Locke again. Clever guy, important philosopher. And in fact, what we're looking at today, John Locke on personal identity, is probably the part of Locke's philosophy that is still most influential and one of the most influential discussions in all of philosophy, I would say. Um, <clears throat> so what is the issue of personal identity? Well, first, before you can uh, talk about personal identity, you have to say a little bit about identity in general. And one way to think about identity is in terms of the equal sign. You know, this. So when we use this, we mean that the thing on one side of it is the same thing as the thing on the other side of it, like Bruce Wayne equals Batman. That is called numerical identity. When things are numerically identical, we say that they are one and the same. Slightly confusingly, we also talk about identical twins. What we're talking about there is we're talking about qualitative identity. And what that means is that they're indistinguishable. That is, you cannot tell one from the other. They have all the same properties. But that is not the same as numerical identity. And Locke makes that clear in, um, in the beginning of his section of identity and diversity. In the very first section, he makes it clear that he doesn't mean uh, qualitative identity. He's going to be talking about numerical identity. What does it take to be literally one and the same individual? And this is a hard topic to discuss because it's one of those kind of very basic ideas that we sort of uh, presume that underlies all of our um, thought. And actually trying to explain what it means is pretty tricky. Uh, and it, at the beginning of this section, it's rather dry and abstract. It's kind of hard to get a grasp on what he's talking about. But very quickly, uh, he gets to the topic of um, what he calls, he uses the Latin, principium individua individuationis. Um, I don't know if that's how they pronounced it in ancient Rome, but nobody does because they didn't have tape recorders. Uh, but what that means is essentially what we now call identity conditions. What are the conditions that determine whether or not one thing is the same thing as, well, I want to say another thing, but it isn't another thing, because if it's one and the same, it's not another thing, it's the same thing. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to understand. If you're asking the question, is this pen the same as this pen? It's like, what are you, stupid? That's a, that's a ridiculous question. Of course it is. But we say of course it is because we already have this notion of identity. Because in theory, something that looks like one pen, there could be an infinite number of pens existing in the same space. But what Locke establishes right from, uh, right from the start is that when we're talking about matter, when we're talking about, say, atoms, if there is one atom in, there, there can only be one atom in one particular location at a time. He says, well, I'm just going to rule out the possibility of infinite uh, atoms in one space. If there's something in, uh, in a space, there's only one of it, if it's an atom. Now, you can have more than one different kinds of things in one space, as for example, he says there are different kinds of substances, God, mind, and body, and you could have uh, obviously, God is supposed to be everywhere, omnipresent, so God is here, um, but also this pen is here, and if there, this pen had a soul, it would also be here. So you could have three different things in one space, but if you're talking about the same kind of substance, like an atom, a material substance, there can only be one at once. Uh, but then, you know, we might be interested in, well, I'm going to take this pen and I'm going to leave it here and I'm going to go away for a hundred years and come back and I find a pen here and I want to know, is it the same pen? So this is the question of identity through time because that's when um, we might be confused. We might want to know uh, if something that we see now is the same as something that we saw sometime in the past. 
And a, a lot of what uh, people talk about in discussing personal identity and a lot of what Locke himself talks about is identity through time. So the identity conditions that determine whether or not something is the same thing now as this thing that we saw in the past, what Locke points out very quickly is the identity conditions are different depending on what we're talking about. So he starts in section three just by talking about a lump of stuff. Um, a mass, like several atoms. So imagine just a lump of clay or something like that. And he says, okay, take a lump of clay, put it there, come back in a week. Is it the same lump of clay? We need to know the identity conditions for a lump of clay to be able to answer that question. And what he says in section three is, must be made of exactly the same atoms. So to be the same mass, uh, what determines whether or not it's the same mass is whether or not it has exactly the same atoms, whether it's made of exactly the same stuff. So if a lump of clay loses even one atom, then it's not the same mass. It's now a new mass, a smaller mass. Okay, so that's the identity conditions for a mass. Who cares though? Who, who talks about identity conditions for mass? Well, it's just sort of to clear the, the way to getting finally to the most important question, which is we're gonna, we're, what we're going to get to in section nine. So these are the section numbers that are in your readings. Secondly, in section four, he talks about vegetables. Ooh, yes, what we've always wanted to know, the identity conditions of a carrot. Well, again, it's kind of important because it lays the groundwork for uh, more interesting things which are living things. So let's look at the example uh, that he gives in section four. He says, uh, that being then one plant which has such an organization of parts in one coherent body partaking of one common life, it continues to be the same plant as long as it partakes of the same life. Um, though that life be communicated to new particles of matter vitally united to the living plant in a like continuant organization conformable to that sort of plant. All right, what the hell is he talking about there? Here's the idea. You take an acorn, you plant it. I don't know, 30 years later, you got an oak tree. Oaks, I, I think, grow pretty slowly. Maybe it's longer than that. Is the acorn the same plant as the oak tree? And the answer he gives is, if the acorn partakes of the same continuous life. Now, this idea is actually uh, requires a little bit of unpacking, and he doesn't really go into this, but so we, all we need to do is, is sort of try and get what he means. And what he means is, there is no point at which the acorn died and a new life started. Because if, an, if the acorn died and a new life started, then the acorn is not the same plant as the tree that results, because there's a gap in the life. But so long as the same life is uh, continuing, then you've got the same plant. Even, and this is the important part, even though the oak tree is probably made of completely new um, atoms, than the acorn was. Because here's how living things seem to work, and this is going to apply to animals and humans as well. Um, living things have this ability to lose some cells and take on new cells. That's what growing involves. Growing involves adding new cells, and in this, uh, at the same time, things that are living parts of you die and fall away. There's death happening in you all the time. You just don't notice it because, I don't know, you don't notice it. Um, in fact, uh, there's a gross statistic that I'm sure is just made up, but people always say like 80% of household dust is human skin. Uh, so think of that when you're vacuuming the floor. This is little dead bits of you. Fortunately, uh, there are all kinds of mites that like to live on dead human skin. So be glad they exist because they eat up your dead bits. 
Anyway, you're shedding dead things all the time. Um, but you're not dying because you're growing new ones. Living things have this ability to make new living things. And that's what's happening in vegetables, and that's what happens in animals, and that's what happens in man. When he, he uses the term man to mean essentially human. He, he doesn't mean it to be a gendered term. That, that's just what they did back then. So whenever you see uh, Locke use the term man, just think of human. It applies to man, men, women, and children. Um, so all of these things have this ability that uh, you, can ha you can have, well, let me give you an example. Here is me. This is a little book that my uh, parents put together when I turned 18 or something like that. So this is me back in the 70s when things were great. Uh, down below a little later, teenage years, not as good. But uh, at least my skin had cleared up by then. That was a good thing. Uh, but I vaguely remember being this kid. But what is for sure is that that kid does not have, if it has any of the same cells that are part of me now, it would be surprising. Um, that kid was made of almost completely different stuff from me. So if we're talking about if we're, we're talking about me as a lump of matter, I am not the same lump of matter as that kid. Obviously, I'm much bigger, for one thing, but it's all, it's all different atoms by now. In fact, somebody, uh, there are mathematicians who work out this stuff, and they worked out that um, of, if you go for, far enough back, like to the time of Socrates or something, uh, there are atoms from Socrates scattered so wide that probably in every breath you take, you're taking in an atom that at one point was a part of Socrates. Nice thought. Does that make you Socrates? No, it does not. But there you go. So uh, in terms of the stuff I'm made of, I'm not made of the same stuff. I'm not the same chunk of matter as that kid. But I am the same human as that kid because there is only one life. I never at any point died in between the taking of that photo and now. It's all one continuous life that unites, um, unites me across time. And of course, it also unites the various parts of me right now. If you want to say, what are the limits of me in this moment? Where do I end? Well, I end where, according to this, where the life ends. Now this raises a question, is my hair part of me? Well, if you pull your hair out, it isn't part of you, obviously, but I'm not sure if hair is still alive. Uh, I don't know. You, if you're a biology major, maybe you can tell me. Um, but certainly my clothes are not part of me, even though they're as attached to me, almost as close as my skin uh, in some places. But they're not part of me because they're not uh, united by the same life. So those are the identity conditions, essentially, of vegetables, animals, and man. In fact, we get to man in section six, human. He says, um, this also shows wherein the identity of the same man consists, that is, nothing but a participation in the same continued life. By constantly fleeting particles of matter. So Locke already knew that we add and lose atoms um, sort of constantly. Uh, somebody once described a living thing as a slow motion fountain because like a fountain, fountain takes in water and ejects water out the top. We take in atoms and we eject atoms when we're done with them. So think of yourself not as a stable thing but as a slow motion fountain. Um, now, but notice, so you're constantly changing and yet you regard yourself as the same. This is a puzzle right back to ancient Greek, Greece. How can you have something be changing and yet be the same? What is it that's the same? And for uh, an animal, it is, which includes humans, it is life. Now, the question is, we finally get to the question that uh, is discussed in the Stephen Law chapter. Um, what is a person? Okay. This 
distinction between human and person is owing to Locke. Locke is the, the person who essentially made this distinction. And he means by person not what we, the way we tend to use it. We tend to use person just as a generic human. See, we, we tend to say person when we don't know if it's a man or a woman. But we're, we're basically using it to mean human. He is not using it that way. He is using it in a special sense. And in fact, in the very last section of this reading, he says person is a forensic term, which means that it is to do with um, legal and ethical issues. Okay, so what is this person? Person, he says, is uh, defined, or at least the identity conditions for a person, are consciousness. And consciousness can do what life does for animals. Just as a single life can unite all, uh, different particles at different times. So, for example, um, a part, an atom can be part of me when I'm the age I was when that picture was taken, and then cease to be part of me, you know, in a week. And then maybe it rejoins me later. Maybe I happen to breathe it in again. Okay, so a, a one atom could be part of me at some point, not part of me, part of me, not part of me, and so on. So the same substance, I'm not, it's not what substance I'm made of that makes me the same person. Nor does, is it the substance I'm made of that makes me the same person. So uh, it's not the substance I'm made of that makes me the same human, not the substance I'm made of that makes me the same person. I am, a, as a person, we are made of stuff. So I am both a human and a person. What makes me a human is the life. What makes me a person is the consciousness. So what are the limits of me um, as what are the limits of me now? I've already said what the limits of me now as a human are, whatever part of me is living. What are the limits of me now as a person? Well, they are what I'm conscious of. So, for example, he has a couple of cases. Uh, we've already seen in the earlier Locke readings that Locke li likes examples involving pain. Well, in this reading, he likes examples involving bits of you being chopped off. So, I don't know, Locke had issues that he was working through. Um, in section 11, the bit of you that he imagines being chopped off is your hand. And it's to make this point. He says, obviously my hand is part of me as a person because I am conscious of it. I am aware of my hand. I can feel with it. But, chop my hand off, I can't feel with it anymore. It is no longer part of me. So, the limits of me are what I am conscious of. And then in chapter, in section 17, in a crazy example, he says, imagine you cut off my little finger, but surprise, surprise, instead of the consciousness remaining in this part, the consciousness all goes into the little finger. So it's as if your little finger says, oh, I've lost my body, but it's you. So it's you is just this little finger that sort of wiggles off in a macabre fashion, uh, leaving this big chunk of stuff uh, lifeless and consciousless, consciousnessless on the floor. If that happened, then the little finger that remains conscious would be the person, because it's the consciousness that matters. Consci what is consciousness? Uh, people do not think of consciousness as like conscience. Do not get these two confused. I have seen this happen too many times. Conscience. Your conscience uh, is that little, uh, you know, voice in your head that says, that's wrong. You know, in every Disney cartoon, it's a little angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other um, that says, you know, tells you what's right and what's wrong. That's what conscience is. That's not what we're talking about. When we talk about consciousness, it means literally awareness, like when you're conscious or when you, uh, you don't have it, when you're unconscious. When you're unconscious, you're not aware of things. You don't have feelings, you don't have sensations. So um, that's what consciousness is. And consciousness defines the limits of me as a person. So what Locke said is uh, each of us can be thought of as a human and can be thought of as a person. Okay. 
normally, in the normal course of things, these are one and the same. The living thing and the conscious thing are one and the same. Possibly, a point at which you are one but not the other happens at the very beginning and maybe at the very end of your life. At the very beginning of your life, if we're talking about you as a human uh, being united by one life, then you come into existence essentially when sperm and egg meet, when you are conceived, because there is a living thing right there. Although, technically, the sperm and the egg are also alive. So maybe, you know, there is a sense if we looked into this that there is one life that has existed back to the dawn of, uh, of life on Earth. That because, uh, you know, I was made of living things that came from my parents and they were made of living things that came from their parents. So, you know, you could sort of press the point and say that, well, if, if it's life that makes one organized entity, then, you know, maybe we're all just one living entity. But I don't want to get into that. So let's assume you start when, you're, when, when you are conceived. But you do not become a person at that point because obviously an embryo doesn't have consciousness. It doesn't have a brain, it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have nerves, it doesn't have any of those things. So it doesn't have consciousness. Um, when does that develop? I don't know. When the brain has reached a certain amount of development, uh, I assume but certainly not at the moment you are conceived. So when you are conceived, you are a human, but you are not a person yet. And similarly, uh, if something unfortunate should happen to you and uh, you get a severe brain injury that destroys your consciousness, as has happened to many people, um, uh, like uh, Terry Schiavo, for example, was a famous case back in the George W. Bush presidency. Terry Schiavo was a, a woman who had an accident and got, fell into a coma, and her husband said, she's brain dead, and her parents said, no, she isn't, and he demanded, the chan he demanded the right to take her off life support, and they said, no, 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 she's still aware, and they got all these videos. You can look on YouTube, you will find videos that they made that appeared to show her eyes following a balloon and stuff. Well, eventually he won the court case, and she was taken off um, life support. And when they did the autopsy, they found that the part of her brain that is capable of consciousness was liquid. It, she'd lost consciousness years ago. She was not aware of anything. But she had been alive. She was being kept alive on a respirator. So clearly she was a human, even though she was brain dead, even though she had no consciousness. So she ceased to be a person at the moment um, the part of her brain that allowed for consciousness was destroyed, but she was still a human. So you can see how uh, it is possible to be a human without being a person. Now, is it possible to be a person without being a human? Uh, well, yes, if you're capable of conscious, uh, consciousness in the right way. Uh, presumably, uh, blib and blob, the Martians in um, Stephen Law are persons in that sense. Okay, the question of personal identity is what makes one person, what makes me as a person now the same as that kid? Because we assume that I am the same person. And before Locke came along and suggested that consciousness was the key feature, there were uh, various theories. The most popular theory, probably, certainly at the time that Locke was writing, was the soul. As you can see, this would be Descartes' theory. Descartes would say that um, if you have the same soul, then you are the same person. Um, now, uh, because we know this because of uh, the part in the meditations where he says, what am I? I am a thinking thing. I know I exist. What am I? I'm a thinking thing. What is this thinking thing? And he decides that it's a mind or a soul. It is a kind of substance, in fact. It is an immaterial stuff, uh, the soul or the mind. Locke is going to argue that I am not, what makes me a person is not 
any substance. And besides God, there are two substances. There is matter and there is mind or soul. Matter or body and mind or soul. And Locke says, it is neither of those things that make me the same person. Um, and this is a very important point. So let's look at what he says in section 14 to argue that it is not having the same soul that makes you the same person. Before we get to that, though, uh, I need to take a brief digression and explain some very important terminology. This is not just important for this section. This is important and not even just important for philosophy. It's important. So listen up. And this is the distinction between necessary and sufficient conditions. Now, this is a very dry definition, but it'll, let's get it out of the way and then I'll give you examples. So something is necessary for something else. What that means is you can't have the second thing without the first thing. So, for example, um, if I have, uh, unless you have an electric car, which is possible, I guess, it never used to be possible when I gave this example, but assuming you have a gas-powered car, starting, uh, having gas in your tank is necessary for your car to start. Why? Because you start, can't start your car without gas in it. However, what that doesn't mean is it doesn't mean that having gas in your car will guarantee that your car will start, because that's something different. That is being sufficient. So if something is sufficient for something else, then the first thing guarantees the second. And having gas in your tank is necessary but not sufficient for your car starting. Because it's necessary because your car won't start unless you have it, but it's not sufficient because merely having gas in your tank will not guarantee that your car will start. You know, you might have a dead battery, somebody might have stolen your engine. So you have a full tank of gas, no engine, your car isn't going to start. Being able to tell the difference between these two things is very useful for working out the relationship between certain things, as we shall see. Um, let me give you one example of sufficient but not necessary. So necessary but not sufficient I've already given you an example of. Uh, having um, gas in your tank is necessary but not sufficient for your car starting. The example I always give, I don't know why, is, is having your head cut off is sufficient for you dying. Why? Because it'll guarantee it. I'm sorry, having your head cut off will cause death. So having your head cut off is sufficient for you dying. But it's not necessary. Why? Cheerful thought. Because you can die many ways. You can, let's hope, in fact, when it finally comes to your time, it's not from having your head cut off, because that's just undignified. Um, there was a uh, the time when people's heads were cut off a lot is the French Revolution, when they did it with a, a guillotine or guillotine. And there was a French noblewoman who knew that she was going to have her head cut off, but she was a keen scientist. So she paid the guy that held the basket that was to catch her head uh, money and said, I will try to blink uh, after my head is cut off. And you are to watch for that to see if it's possible. And apparently she did blink, so maybe I should change my example. But you get the idea. She didn't, she didn't live long, even if she lived for a, a split second. Um, so uh, having your head cut off is sufficient, but not necessary. Now, there are some things that are closely related, but not in, the, in either of these ways. So for example, smoking and getting cancer. Uh, but it's important, even then, it's important to note that different things prove uh, that it's not necessary from proving that it's not sufficient. So, smoking is not necessary for getting cancer. What proves that? Walter White. If you've ever seen um, uh, Breaking Bad, and you should, uh, Walter White gets lung cancer despite never having been a smoker, because he's a chemistry teacher. Chemistry teacher is always inhaling things. I could tell you all kinds of stories from my chemistry teacher. But we don't have time. Um, what proves that smoking is not sufficient for getting lung cancer? My granddad. My granddad smoked a pipe from the time he was 12 to the time he was 92, and he didn't get lung cancer. Uh, can you imagine a 12-year-old smoking a pipe? Adorable. 
Uh, he gave it up when he was 92 because he kept falling asleep with his lit pipe in his mouth and setting fire to his blankets, and it pissed my gran off. Uh, okay, so not smoking and uh, causing cancer are correlated, but, but smoking is neither necessary nor sufficient for um, uh, lung cancer. What's all this got to do with the current topic? Well, if having the same soul guarantees that you're the same person, then same soul is both necessary and sufficient for same person. Okay? If they're one and the same thing, if a soul and a person are one and the same thing, then each of them is necessary and sufficient for the other thing. Uh, for example, being an unmarried man is both necessary and sufficient for being a bachelor. Being an unmarried man is necessary for a bachelor because you can't be a bachelor without being an unmarried man. Being an unmarried man is sufficient for being a bachelor. If you're an unmarried man, you are a bachelor. Even if you're not a very, not one that anyone's chasing, even if you're 105, uh, if you're an unmarried man, you're, you're a bachelor. Okay, so we want to, if we're getting the correct definition of person, we have to find something that is both necessary and sufficient for being a person. Is having the same soul uh, sufficient for being the same person? And uh, in section 14, Locke gives an example that shows that having the same soul is not sufficient for being the same person. And this is, um, he says, suppose a Christian Platonist or Pythagorean should, upon God's having ended all of his works of creation the seventh day, think his soul hath existed ever since, and should imagine it has revolved in several human bodies. Let me um, say a bit about this. Plato, we've already talked about. Plato believed that your soul pre-existed your body. In fact, that's how you learned about the forms. Your soul, in its disembodied state, found out about the, the, the forms, and then when it was added to your body, uh, you forgot about it and you, you have to remember. Okay, but the, the point is, souls can pre-exist uh, the body. Uh, and Pythagoras believed in transmigration. Transmigration is when one soul can, pre can be inside different people. Um, or if uh, even sometimes an animal and a, a human, as for example in, um, in Hindus. Hindus believe in karma, that when you die, your soul goes on, and if you've got good karma, it goes on to a better kind of life, and if you have bad karma, it goes to a worse. So if, you're, if you've been a shitty person, you could become a cockroach. Your soul could enter a cockroach in the next life. That's transmigration, which of course allows for reincarnation, because reincarnation is when you're born again. But literally, transmigration is uh, the soul moving between bodies. Okay, he says, now notice he says Christian Platonists. Nowadays, we would just say Christian, because Christians have absorbed this idea of Plato, this idea that we have an immortal soul. That's become kind of mainstream Christianity. It wasn't necessarily the case when Locke was writing this, this idea. Um, that's why he, he said Christian Platonist. Okay, suppose one of these people should, upon, uh, should imagine that the soul has existed before that my soul has existed before my life as a human. And in fact, he says, I once met with one, presumably a Christian Platonist, I once met with one who was persuaded that his soul had been the soul of Socrates. Now, Locke um, says, I don't know if he was right or not, but suppose he was. Could this guy remember being Socrates? No, absolutely not. The guy says, no, I have no memories of being Socrates. I just know that my soul was Socrates's. So here's, uh, think of it this way. If um, dualists like Descartes are right, you have a body and you also have a soul or a mind. The body is made of atoms, the soul or mind is a different kind of immaterial stuff. So they can exist independently of each other. And we're talking about that stuff, that immaterial stuff. But that's not the same as the contents of your mind, your memories, your personality. 
That is not the same thing as your soul. That is just what is in your soul. Think of your soul as like a notebook. When uh, you start out with your soul, it is blank. There is nothing in it. And then as you acquire memories, it's as if stuff is written in the notebook. So your memories and stuff are like writing, and the soul is like the notebook. What happened with this guy who claimed to have Socrates' soul is he got the notebook, but he didn't get any of the writing. That is, Socrates had the soul, used it, filled it with writing, but then when Socrates died, all the writing is scrubbed out of it. It's as if it's all erased. It's, or, or you can think of a soul as like a videotape. You don't know what a videotape is. May, ask, your, ask your dad. Um, a videotape, uh, and you know, when in the old days, videotapes were expensive, so you would video something, watch it, then you would wipe the tape clean and use it again. Um, you know, the old sitcoms have lots of jokes about people recording over, uh, you know, recording the birth of their first child, and then somebody wipes it clean to record an episode of some stupid show, uh, and everybody's outraged. Imagine that happens with the soul that it, it has all of Socrates' memories in it while Socrates is using it, but it gets wiped clean, and then when this guy, who turns out to be the mayor of some small town, we find out later, called Queenborough or something that I've never heard of. Um, yeah, later on we meet this guy again. Anyway, um, so all that happens, this guy has the soul of Socrates, but he doesn't have any of his memories. And Locke says, He's not Socrates. He's not Socrates. He's not the same person as Socrates, even though he has the same soul. So what does that show? That shows that having the same soul is not sufficient for being the same person. Nor is it necessary, says Locke. Well, let's get to body for, uh, for a second. Now, the body theory is the idea that what makes me the same as I am now is, um, is having the same body. What makes me, makes me the same as that kid I showed you the picture of is that I have the same body. Well, now hang on a minute. I obviously don't have the same, I don't, it doesn't look the same. This is a lot bigger, a lot more, um, it has a bit less hair on top and, you know. Um, it's obviously not the same, it doesn't look the same. But is it the same body? He would say yes in the sense that it's the same animal living thing. So if you think of my body as the animal, then I do have uh, the same body. If you think of the body as just a chunk of atoms, then no, I don't have the same chunk of atoms as that kid. But um, a more sensible view, so the, a body theorist of personal identity would say um, it's the same living thing, if you have the same living thing. Now, what Locke says is, well, it's not having the same body that makes me the same person. And to prove this, he gives, in section 15, one of the most famous examples in all of philosophy, the prince and the cobbler. He says, should the soul of a prince carrying with it the consciousness of the prince's past life enter and inform the body of a cobbler, you know, someone who fixes shoes, as soon as uh, deserted by his own soul, everyone sees he would be the same person with the prince. So you imagine a prince and a cobbler, and they swap both souls and consciousnesses. Which one is the prince? Is it the one with the prince's body? No. It's the one with the cobbler's body. Because if you ask that guy, are you the prince, he will say, yeah, and I don't know what I'm doing in this body. So in other words, uh, this section proves that having the same body is not sufficient for being the same person because uh, the prince no longer has the same body. He has a new body, but he's still the prince. Now, slightly confusingly, he said, well, wait a minute, that seems to suggest that it goes with the soul because it, the soul of the uh, prince goes into the cobbler's body and um, it's, uh, it, it's still the prince. But what the most important part of that is that it's the consciousness of the cobbler that goes into the prince's body and the consciousness of the prince that goes into the cobbler's body. It doesn't matter if they're the same soul. 
And in fact, just as, as Locke says, we don't know that souls aren't like bodies. We know bodies lose bits all the time and gain new ones. Maybe souls are the same. Maybe I don't, maybe I'm, I don't have exactly the same soul anymore. Maybe I have an entirely new soul. I wouldn't know. It's like, um, think of uh, a person as being like a picture that you store on a computer. You don't know where exactly that picture is. You just know that you can recall it. Maybe it gets stored on the hard drive. Maybe then it gets uploaded to the cloud. Maybe you don't know what, where that picture is, but you can recall it anytime you want. Is it the same picture? Yes, it's the same picture. Is it composed of the same electrical impulses? No. It's been stored on a, a hard drive. It's been put in the cloud. It's been all over the place, but all that matters is that it's the same picture. That's what Locke is saying about persons and consciousnesses. So long as you have the same consciousness, you are the same person. How do I know I was that kid? Because I can remember being that kid. All right. So it is not the soul, it is not the body. Uh, and incidentally, um, so having the same soul is not sufficient because I could have the same soul as Socrates, but I'm not the same person. I am not Socrates. It's not necessary. For all I know, I've got an entirely new soul. For all I know, my soul has been replaced, is being replaced all the time. I wouldn't know any way than I know about where my pictures are stored. All I care is the picture itself. All I care is the consciousness. The soul is just the vessel for the consciousness. All right. Now, a very important part of this discussion of uh, Locke's um, of personal identity is he ties personal identity to reward and punishment. So, remember, each of us is both a human and a person. And you might say, well, maybe I care more about the human than the person. Maybe I care more about the body uh, than than the consciousness in the body. Maybe uh, the prince it cares more about the body uh, of the prince than the awareness he has of himself. But so what, why is person more important than identity of human? Answer, because person is a forensic term, as he says in section 26. That is, personhood is what ties us to reward and punishment. So for example, Suppose in the case of the prince and the cobbler, the cobbler commits a crime and gets, you know, a horrible murder, he's got blood all over his hands. And then just after he's committed this crime, the consciousness is swapped. And then they come and arrest the guy with blood on his hands, who is the cobbler. But now it's got the prince's consciousness inside the cobbler and he says, I'm, I, I'm innocent, I didn't do anything. Who should be punished? Should it be the body, because it has blood on its hands, and literally that's the body that committed the murder, or should it be the cobbler, the, the, the consciousness in the prince's body who remembers committing the crime? And what Locke says, it should be, you should punish the person who is now in the prince's body, because reward and punishment go with consciousness and awareness. Now, this has some strange, uh, first of all, that seems right, right? If, because it's the consciousness that plans the, the murder, that remembers the murder, that thought about the murder, that had murderous intentions. None of that, the body was just a means of carrying it out. It's not the body that is evil. Although there's a cool, cool schlocky movie that uh, I have particular fondness for or because I was a graduate student in Los Angeles and I saw, saw this in preview, which is when they uh, let people in to watch the movie before it's been released uh, and you have to fill out little cards to say whether or not you like it and if everybody hates it, they make some changes before they release it. The movie I saw was Body Parts, early 90s movie. Nobody knows about this movie. It tanked, but I thought it was great. Um, and the, the basic premise of that is that the body parts themselves are evil. And this guy loses a, an arm in an accident and he gets a new arm and it turns out it's the arm of a murderer. And this uh, arm starts making him do evil things. Great, great schlocky movie, bullshit premise. Locke would totally disagree with this. It's the consciousness of, um, 
the consciousness that determines whether or not you are guilty of something. So, some strange implications of this are detailed in sections 19, 20, 22, 20, and 23. In section 19, he imagines Socrates waking and sleeping. Imagine Socrates waking and sleeping don't share consciousnesses, which seems right. I mean, a lot of people never remember any of their dreams, but they're having dreams. They just don't remember them. Imagine, though, that when you're dreaming, you remember all the previous dreams. So, in effect, there are two consciousnesses, one that's in you while you're awake and one that's in you while you're asleep. They are two different persons in the same body. And he, uh, Locke think this is perfectly possible. In fact, it comes up again in section 23. But su suppose um, Socrates dreams something evil. Should we blame Socrates awake for what Socrates asleep dreams? Only if Socrates awake can remember that or has a consciousness of it. If he doesn't, if he has no recollection of that, then he is not guilty of that. Okay, does that mean you can get off from a crime if you have amnesia? So suppose I commit a, a, a horrible murder and then get total amnesia so that I literally cannot remember it. And rather uh, worryingly, apparently, this is an actual thing, that murderers, because what they're doing is so shocking, it has the effect that they, they sometimes forget. Some people suggested that this happened to OJ, um, that he literally did not remember committing the crime. Um, suppose that was the, tr and I'm going to assume that he did commit the crime. I'm sorry uh, if that disagrees with you. Let's just say that when I'm talking about OJ, I'm going to assume that he killed two people. Um, I, that, I was in LA at the time of the trial. Good times. There was a, there was a guy selling t-shirts outside the courthouse in LA, and one of them says, one pile of t-shirts said, OJ is innocent, and the other pile said, squeeze the juice. In other words, you know, get him for the crime. So he was covering all his bases, this guy. Anyway, amnesia. Does amnesia get you out of, uh, uh, of guilt? And Locke says, yes, it does. If you literally have no consciousness of having committed the crime, then it wasn't committed by you, the person. What about drunk? I am ashamed to say that in my undergraduate days, uh, on two occasions, I got blackout drunk. And I literally did things that my friends told me about later, that were, and I know they happened because I got independent uh, confirmation from people who didn't talk to each other, uh, that were very embarrassing. But I have literally no memory of it. This is why I don't drink much anymore. Um, does that mean I shouldn't feel embarrassed because if I don't have any memory of doing these embarrassing things involving vomiting, um, I shouldn't be embarrassed about that because I have no memory of it and therefore it wasn't me? Locke says, yes, I sh I'm off the hook because that was not me. Because if it was me, I would have consciousness of it. Um, now, what his critics say, and he imagines his critics in this section, is, but we punish drunk people, we punish people all the time after they've sobered up for what they do when they're drunk, even if they can't remember it. And Locke says, yeah, I know we do. And the reason we do is because we're fallible people and because we don't know, it, we, we can't tell if they really can't remember it. We don't believe them. We think they're just trying to get out of it, so we don't believe them, so we punish them, because we're humans. But God knows, and God, on the day of judgment, will uh, punish only the ones who literally remember it. He says at the end of section 22, in the great day wherein the secrets, secrets of all hearts shall be laid open, it may be reasonable to think no one shall be made to answer for what he knows nothing of. Um, section 23, I love this, night man and day man, uh, nothing to do with uh, always sunny in Philadelphia. He says, these are two possibilities. First, he imagines one body, two different co uh, consciousnesses, like Socrates waking and sleeping, or like um, the Hulk and Bruce Banner. In the early days of the Hulk comic, he became the Hulk when night fell. And uh, 
was Bruce Banner when the sun came up again. So, um, you know, like a werewolf or something like that. And he had no, neither of them had any consciousness of the other. They, had, they didn't, uh, the Hulk couldn't remember being Bruce Banner and vice versa. Are these two different persons in one body? Yes, they are. Uh, then he says, on the other side, the same consciousness acting by intervals in two different bodies. There's a movie called Being John Malkovich, which you absolutely have to see if you haven't seen it. If you haven't seen it and you don't know anything about it, whatever you're expecting, it's not that. But it does have uh, an instance of someone being able to put their consciousness in another person's body, specifically John Malkovich, who is an actor. Um, <clears throat> so both of these things are possible. Crazy stuff, right? Uh, but if, my, if I could put my consciousness in your body and control your body to go commit a crime and then zap it back into my body, I'm guilty of the crime, not you, despite the fact that it's your body that uh, fingerprints are everywhere. So, very interesting uh, ideas there. Um, Locke's theory opens up all kinds of possibilities that we'll get into in a little bit, and I haven't got to the criticisms of Thomas Reed, um, who wrote about 100 years after Locke, and uh, he echoes some criticisms that other people came up with, but he also he did it in rather a, a neat way. But that's Locke's theory, and it's very, uh, very interesting. It says, what makes me the same person as me when I was a kid is this consciousness, which presumably means memory. Because how can I have consciousness of the kid? The kid has consciousness of, of, of being the kid. I have consciousness of being me. How is it we share consciousness? It seems like it has to be memory. So I can, have, I can still have the awareness that the kid has by remembering it. And that's what makes for person, or personal identity through time, is consciousness. And if there are gaps in consciousness, then I'm not the person. So you can be the same human without being the same person. Crazy stuff.